Hello, my name is Dr. Veronica Hood, and I'm the Scientific Director at the Gervais Syndrome Foundation. Thank you for joining us today for our Gene Therapy Educational Series entitled AAV-Mediated Gene Therapy for Developmental and Epileptic Encephalopathies. This educational series is provided by the Gervais Syndrome Foundation in collaboration with Encoded Therapeutics and is intended for healthcare providers. This three-part educational series will be led by two experts in the field, Dr. Sarah Weckhausen from the University of Antwerp and Dr. Michael Lawler from the Medical College of Wisconsin. Throughout this series, Dr. Lawler and Dr. Weckhausen will take us through the basic concepts of gene therapy and AAV-mediated gene therapy, considerations for moving AAV-mediated gene therapy from preclinical research into clinical development programs, and the potential application of gene therapy to address the underlying genetic cause of the DEEs. Please submit any questions you may have through the intake form on the DSF website by December 15th, and we'll post responses in March. Today, we kick off the first session in this three-part educational webinar series. During today's session, Dr. Lawler will introduce us to the basic concepts of gene therapy and AAV-mediated gene therapy. Dr. Lawler is a professor of pathology and associate director of the Neuroscience Research Center at the Medical College of Wisconsin. Dr. Lawler directs two clinical laboratories that process and diagnose muscle and nerve biopsies, and his research group has many industry collaborations on congenital myopathy, muscular dystrophy, mitochondrial disease, and gene therapy. And with that, I will turn the session over to Dr. Lawler. Hello, my name is Mike Lawler. I've been asked to give uh, part one of the series, which is called Introduction to AAV Mediated Gene Therapy. Uh, I am a professor of pathology at the Medical College of Wisconsin, uh, and I of work with a number of companies in the uh, gene therapy field, particularly in muscle disease, and specifically with vectors uh, involving the adeno-associated virus. And so, as we'll talk about today, that's that's a key focus of the talk today is to provide uh, some background uh, on AAV gene therapy in the context of, of gene therapy in general. So, in terms of the talk today, I'm going to have um, a few topics that I cover. A lot of this talk is actually going to be an introduction to gene therapy and the vocabulary that surrounds the field of gene therapy. So there's a, a variety of um, uh, possible directions that gene therapy can go and be utilized. Uh, there's a lot of terminology that uh, gets thrown around. So I'm going to try to cover that as completely as possible and accessibly as possible um, while also focusing on why many companies decide on uh, viral gene therapy vectors and specifically the adeno-associated virus as a key uh, gene therapy vector for current trials. Uh, at the end of the talk, I'm also gonna talk about some uh, general logistical and uh, uh, manufacturing considerations for um, AAV-mediated gene therapy that are uh, likely to impact safety uh, margins. And in the second talk, actually, I'll be talking uh, specifically about some of the safety considerations uh, that have been uh, observed in AAVG therapy recently. And so overall, this first uh, brief talk should provide uh, the background in gene therapy that um, is required to understand uh, what's going on a lot in the field. And then that, that update will, will be the content of the, of the second talk in the series. So first, overall, what is gene therapy? So when you're talking about uh, gene therapy in general, you're talking about the use of exogenous genetic material to uh, take a cell that has a defective gene and then restore that genetic material um, in some way so that the uh, cell becomes more fully functional. And this can be done in a variety of ways that is dependent on the kind of nature of the disease that you're dealing with. And so in cases where um, the gene product may be missing, the goal here may be to add a new gene. Uh, if there's a gene that's not uh, functioning properly, 
then um, it's possible to deactivate uh, that non-functional gene. It's possible to introduce changes in nucleotide sequence uh, by editing the gene. It's possible to upregulate uh, or downregulate gene expression. And then usually in the context of uh, cancer, it's also possible to change immune cells uh, to attack uh, diseased cells in, in a specific manner. And so overall, I think the key elements of gene therapy is that they the approach is designed to actually address the specific cause of a disease rather than provide symptomatic support um, and also that it relates to the transfer of some element of um, or modulation of some element of genetic expression um, in order to achieve this goal. So gene therapy has the potential to treat a lot of diseases and, and there already are a number of uh, trials in progress uh, across a broad range of disorders. And the most common of these is actually cancer. But even outside um, the cancer arena, which I'm not really going to talk about much today because it's it's not something I, I deal with often, you can see a broad range of other disorders, uh, including hematological disorders, neurological disorders, uh, metabolic disorders, that are all um, targets of current gene therapy studies. And in particular, neuro neurological diseases are uh, an area where uh, a lot of investigation is going on, and specifically disorders that have a problem in a single gene. And so that the modulation or replacement of uh, the expression of um, a single disease gene or the restoration of a single disease product uh, is a desirable um, uh, feature in the treatment of it. And, and gene therapy is a good match for that kind of situation. Now, to provide a little context around the, the language use in gene therapy, when, when you talk about genetic uh, therapy or genetic manipulation, it's important to recognize that there's a couple of different types of cells that can be targeted. And so in, in all of these treatment uh, type studies that we're talking about here, we're really talking about somatic ger gene therapy rather than germline gene therapy. So you're targeting the somatic cells, which are the non-reproductive uh, cells in the body. And so this is really important, right, because if there's going to be genetic material added to the cells or genetic changes occurring in the cells. And if you target somatic cells rather than germline cells, so the egg or the sperm cells, your genetic intervention is going to be targeted to the individual you're trying to treat. And uh, there should not be the possibility of passing this on to future generations. And so while in theory, some of these technologies could be used to alter uh, germline expression of egg and sperm. There's obvious ethical implications uh, that are not well um, discussed at this point, I would say, or uh, and, and guidelines don't exist. And so it should, it is and should be very well restricted and even banned in most countries. And, and so that we're not really discussing in gene therapy treatment the idea of treating at the germline level. Uh, we really are focusing on uh, somatic cells to treat the individual patient that's uh, sitting in front of us. Now, when considering methods of somatic gene therapy delivery, um, it's important to recognize that you can take a couple of approaches. So the first would be in vivo transduction. So that would be uh, the kind of traditional approach of taking your treatment agent and treating the individual, right? So you're, you're taking your vector, uh, in this case, a virus in this image, and you're delivering it um, to the whole body of the individual. Now, um, this is useful for um, situations where you need a lot of expression across a lot of cells and that the cells can't be removed from the body. Uh, the disadvantages is, are that you need to give, in general, a pretty high dose to be able to distribute it to all the cells that you want to give it to. Uh, and of course, with uh, things like increasing dose and increasing complexity and exposure to the immune system, um, there is the possibility for immune uh, or toxic related safety events in tissues for which the virus itself isn't uh, meant to be particularly effective. Um, in contrast, okay, there is the possibility of ex vivo uh, transduction. And so this is uh, a situation in which some target tissues um, can be harvested from patients into cells and uh, the 
virus or vector can be exposed directly to those cells, and the modified cells can then be transplanted back into the patient. And in some cases, especially when you're dealing with, uh, with circulating cell tissues, such as the uh, hematologic system, this can be a really uh, good way to target the specific cell type without exposing your entire body uh, or the entire patient's body to, um, to the therapeutic agent. And so in some cases, this has been, been very successful, but again, it's an issue of whether or not the target tissue and the disease matches um, this application. Um, the advantage, obviously, is that you limit the amount of material that you need and potentially limit toxicity. Um, the disadvantage is, in some cases, it works better than others, uh, and the cells that you reintroduce into the body need to do everything that you need uh, done to uh, reduce the disease phenotype, and sometimes that doesn't happen. Now, another decision in looking at gene therapy uh, approaches is really matching up the gene therapy approach, either at the DNA or the RNA manipulation level, with the features of the disease, because there's different causative pathophysiologies to a number of different diseases, and different gene um, intervention strategies may match better to the specific problem. And so, for instance, when you are looking at, for instance, a monogenetic disease where you've lost function, so you've knocked out, for instance, the function of an important protein because of a, a particularly um, uh, deleterious uh, mutation, it's possible to do gene replacement, which is just to use the virus to introduce a, a uh, fully functional copy of that gene and then reintroduce expression and then uh, ideally that will fix the disease phenotype. Um, a different look of the same approach would be gene addition. So that would just be taking, uh, doing the same strategy but using a foreign gene rather than uh, a, a working copy of the gene that's uh, that's abnormal. There's also possible, as we'll talk about on a few slides here, to influence gene regulation. So if you have uh, insufficient expression of, uh, of a gene, but at least a portion of the product is working well, it may be possible to increase the expression of the gene that's working well. Uh, and then, of course, a lot of people talk about gene editing. So this is the idea of um, leveraging the uh, damage and repair um, mechanisms within the cell to fix a specific mutation and uh, rewrite the sequence. And so this is something that's under active investigation as well. And so those are all examples of things that you could change in the DNA level that may be uh, good for specific scenarios and all have uh, their own positive advantages and disadvantages. Now on the RNA level, it's also possible to intervene. So when you have something that is being produced, uh, that is producing a dominant negative or a, a clearly deleterious or toxic effect, it may be possible to uh, silence the expression of uh, that gene or protein at the RNA level um, by preventing its translation. And at the same time, um, a somewhat popular approach in the last few years has been to um, change transcriptional events to either get rid of um, mutations within uh, the RNA transcript or um, just manipulate RNA transcripts uh, before the protein gets translated in a variety of other ways. And so an example of that would be uh, exon skipping. And so that would be um, an additional way to intervene at the RNA level. Now, when considering the vectors available for use, um, there are, it, we'll drill down on this issue in a few different um, categories. But first, of course, is, is viral versus non-viral approaches. And as I had mentioned, the focus of today's talk is, is viral approaches, but uh, material here is really to provide additional information for people who are, are curious about non-viral approaches. And so, you know, the idea behind a viral approach is to use um, use altered viruses they are engineered to be therapeutic agents, uh, but they're leveraging the kind of evolutionary advantages of vir that viruses have developed um, to distribute themselves among target tissues um, in the same way that naturally occurring viruses do, but without uh, the pathogenic potential 
uh, that that um, natural viruses have. Um, in contrast, it's possible to introduce genetic material uh, through physical or chemical means, and the um, category of vector that that uses that approach is called uh, a non-viral vector. And as you can see here, there's you know different examples of each of these viral and non-viral vectors. Um, the a key element of why people like viral vectors is that there is um, long-term expression achievable with viral vectors that that isn't often seen with non-viral vectors and so that's really fueled the development of that uh, the key disadvantage to viral vectors is that it does increase the um, likelihood of safety issues um, based on the fact that of course the immune system is uh, designed to recognize invading viruses and so there's a variety of ways that you can counteract potential immune responses um, through the thoughtful selection of what viruses to use, for instance. Um, but in general, the uh, potential for toxicity uh, with non-viral vectors is generally lower than with viral vectors, but um, a key element for using viral vectors is that once you get the genetic material into the patient, um, the treatment will persist. And it's particularly important in a situation where the path to redosing patients isn't necessarily clear, which is certainly the case uh, for gene therapy at the moment. So this is just to um, identify the that gene therapy really is being investigated in a variety of vector strategies, but you can see that as shown in blue here, the vast majority of um, studies active studies right now are looking at uh, viral vectors and then among the viral vectors um, there are um, uh, a number of different possibilities uh, for use some of which uh, are kind of being grandfathered in as they were older approaches and some of them are really uh, specifically tailored to the disease Now, one other element of kind of vocabulary to um, integrate into this talk uh, is the issue of integration versus non-integration uh, into the genome. And so this is an element um, of genetic um, manipulation that just needs to be known and considered when you're selecting uh, a vector and when you're evaluating safety. And so the idea here of an integrating vector is that the DNA, once it's uh, transferred into the cell, uh, regardless of uh, the method of delivery, has the potential to either integrate into the, uh, the patient DNA, or it has the potential to form its own stable structures and exist in the nuclei, nucleus without actually integrating into the patient's genetic code. And the concern for integration is that if um, you integrate randomly, there's the potential for uh, the interruption of important genes for the patient. So you may cause another uh, disease as a result of the integration of your vector by disrupting another key gene, uh, which may be, for instance, a tumor suppressor and then um, have uh, the DNA damage produced by integration actually produce um, a different, an entirely different disorder like cancer. Um, the potential advantage of an integrating vector, if it can be manipulated appropriately, of course, is that then you'd have the, a copy of your genetic um, sequence, your corrected genetic sequence within every cell and that it would be retained upon dividing. Um, at the moment, the current state of the art for gene therapy in general is to stick with non-integrating vectors. So the idea here is that you'd be giving a, uh, a large dose of um, viral vector, um, let's just say AAV, and that the dose of DNA that would be getting into the nucleus would be sufficient for you to, for the DNA to associate and form stable DNA structures uh, that would be able to stick around in the nucleus for a long period of time. Um, these would not necessarily be transferred over to future generations of dividing cells, so they would just um, they would be uh, independent. But at the same time, they wouldn't be causing any additional uh, genetic toxicity, uh, as they wouldn't actually be directly interacting uh, with the 
with the patient's DNA. And so when looking at general viral vectors, uh, there's a number of things to um, consider when selecting the appropriate one. And in general, at this point, at least what, what I see most often are uh, companies that work with AAV. <clears throat> I also talk to groups that work with lentivirus and really like that. And I run much less frequently into anybody that's actively um, developing adenovirus. And so the, the key decision points here related to um, these things. So for AAV, the uh, key advantages, I should say, are that uh, it's not a naturally pathogenic uh, virus. The integration of the target cell genome is extremely low. <clears throat> so if you look very, very hard, you can find examples of it occurring, but in general, the integration and the genotoxicity does not uh, occur and is not observed. Uh, it, it has low immunogenicity and that it has very long um, transgene expression. Now, the key disadvantage in that associated virus is that it has a very limited packaging capacity. And so that means that the genetic sequence, the therapeutic genetic sequence that you can um, pack into an AAV is pretty limited. So it's great for small genes, right? Because you could uh, entirely uh, replace the sequence of a small gene and get the entire full length product. But for a large gene, this is going to be a very small uh, portion of a large gene. So you're going to need some sort of strategy to accommodate uh, as complete a restoration of function as possible without necessarily having the full structure or sequence of, uh, of the original gene. Um, adenovirus, in comparison, was uh, a virus that was used a bit before AAV, and it was advantageous because it had a much larger packaging uh, capacity, and again, it didn't have integration into the genome. The issue with this one was that it had high immunogenicity, and as a component of that, the uh, transgene expression really didn't uh, last very long. And so you didn't have prolonged expression, and the high immunogenicity also uh, gives it a more unfavorable safety profile. And so that's one of the reasons that it's not really as actively pursued uh, in the current and new trials that are being done. Uh, lentivirus is actually very attractive for a number of reasons as well. It has a larger packaging capacity, which is great. It does have uh, the potential for integration into the target cell genome, however, um, and the degree to which this occurs is, is, a, is a little bit uh, controversial still. Um, but the, uh, the fact that it happens is, is often enough to have um, people decide on going the AAV route, and I, I think um, additional studies are required to really um, you know, lay down when it's most appropriate to use lens virus versus AAV. Again, you know, you're looking at prolonged expression, low immunogenicity, so there's certainly a role uh, for this um, approach, especially for slightly larger genes, if um, the potential for integration in the target cell genome is well controlled. So now for the, for the rest of this talk, um, now that I've talked a little bit about some of the options that are available. I'm really going to focus on AAVs. Um, and so the when you talk about a recombinant AAV vector, it's important to recognize that this is derived from an adeno-associated virus, which is a naturally occurring virus um, that is not overtly pathogenic, but does infect humans. And the way that um, that viruses in general are structured is that you have this outer coating called a uh, capsid and then a, a genome, uh, in this case of single-stranded DNA, that has two sequences which are inverted terminal repeats and then uh, some replication genes and some capsid genes. And so this is the naturally occurring AAV genome and this is what uh, encodes the ability for the infecting virus to allow more copies of itself to be produced and then to spread uh, throughout an organism's body. Now, when we're talking about creating a recombinant therapeutic AAV, these rep and cap genes are actually removed. And so this gives the carrying capacity between the inverted terminal repeats 
and uh, and so this is really your um, space in which you can fit your promoter okay your transgene and then this poly a tail and uh, so the uh, promoter is going to allow you to control when the DNA when and where the DNA is expressed okay so the this is the this it says here it's a switch that initiates expression there are certain cell types or certain situations uh, in which promoters can be activated and so you can design your therapeutic virus to only be expressed in certain cells or in certain situations um, and so that that selectivity lies in the promoter so while the virus may go everywhere and may get into all the cells you can really um, modulate where the protein the mRNA and the protein are being expressed the transgene of course is your gene of interest so uh, this is the sequence um, encoding the protein that you're missing for instance and then this poly a tail is um, what's a, a sequence that's allowing the synthesis of um, the mRNA transcript um, and and so that's just an again a necessary necessary uh, regulatory element for expression um, these inverted terminal repeats are important because they allow the capsid um, structure to encapsulate the um, the piece of DNA and so the idea here is that you have a capsid that may be identical to the wild type capsid and then your specially designed uh, viral DNA that has the promoter and transgene that you've designed um, as a replacement for um, the AAB genomes naturally occurring um, sequence. Now in terms of what happens with the delivery of AAV vectors, um, so you can see here you have you expose the virus to the cells or to the patient these are going to circulate around um, the environment you put it in the idea here is that you the cells are taken in um, to the or the viruses are taken in via an endosome okay this end of endosome eventually allows the uh, degradation of the capsid but the delivery of the dna into the nucleus and then these this DNA in the nucleus um, is going to form a double-stranded circular episome that's ready for transcription and uh, at, there's a specific dose at which this happens successfully and stably enough that you have long-term uh, maintenance of the episome within the nucleus and long-term expression of the transgene. Um, as noted earlier, uh, when you're using AAVs, there is uh, a very very low chance of the integration of uh, the viral DNA into the uh, patient's genome. Uh, it's been observed rarely in um, animal models of liver gene therapy, but it's never been reported in uh, human studies to date. Now, when you're looking within AAV vectors, there's also a variety of different subtypes of AAV, and so you can just see a list of several of them here. The, this this capsid serotype um, that we're talking about here in part provides a little bit of tissue selectivity in terms of the biodistribution and so you can see that the um, across the 10 types of AAV serotypes that are listed here there's different what they call tissue tropisms or the um, selected air tissues that to which the virus distributes uh, better with each different serotype. Uh, a lot of current studies use AAV9 because it distributes very broadly across a number of, uh, of tissues in which gene therapy is really being tested, particularly skeletal muscle, you know, liver, uh, CNS. And so AAV9 um, is a serotype that's very commonly used. There is an element of selectivity in uh, using other serotypes, um, but in general, um, you know, it, it, it depends on the disease itself. And when you look at what's currently in trials, so here's a number of um, trials and sponsors, you can see that really runs the gamut of a number of different AAV serotypes. There's eight, nine, two, five. Um, it's partially dependent on um, 
the, uh, the disease and uh, the time at which these trials started and what the preferred gene therapy uh, vector was. And as you can see here, so the, the different uh, phases of these trials that are active as well. So um, this is something that people are definitely getting an increasing handle on as they get more experience. Okay, so now to close out this talk, I'd like to talk a little bit about the AAV, uh, limitations of AAV-mediated gene therapy. And so, as I mentioned before, um, a big limitation of AAV gene therapy is packaging capacity. So the, the uh, packaging capacity of 4.7 kilobases limits the size of the genes that can be used. Um, there's a lot of disorders that are associated with genes much, much larger than 4.7 kilobases. And so there are a few ways to get around this limitation to increase the um, usefulness of this approach. Um, but it's not necessarily a given uh, in any given disease that AAV is, is going to be appropriate, um, or frankly, many of the other uh, viral vectors. There's also an issue of potency. So as we get more experience treating human patients with um, AAV gene therapy, it's clear that some of them, especially um, with diseases that have a very large amount of tissue affected, such as skeletal muscle uh, disorders, may require very high levels of gene therapy to provide an adequate therapeutic effect. And so this is going to require really high dose levels. And that, of course, offers some challenges with uh, respect to making enough of the therapeutic agent. It also offers the potential for a greater level of toxicity um, as you increase the body's exposure to the therapeutic agent. Um, there are also challenges with respect to selectivity. So as, um, as noted on the prior slide, there is some tissue tropism to AAVs, but also when you're using them at such high dose levels, the, um, the selectivity of the capsids is not necessarily an ideal way to um, uh, target certain tissues with uh, the naturally occurring AAV serotypes. And so there needs to be some thought to um, getting, of course, effective doses to the selected tissues having the um, appropriate level of expression within the selected tissues and then minimizing toxic and off-target effects. And then a large, um, a large challenge, of course, is manufacturing because, as we'll talk about, the uh, production of a complex molecule like an, or a complex uh, almost organism, such as an AV, which is a protein and a DNA component, um, is really something that is a lot more difficult than the production of a chemical, uh, which is what a lot of therapeutic uh, manufacturing is based around. And so um, there's a lot of development that's been necessary for that and um, the ability to produce high quality batches of AAV material and the doses that are required um, are is a significant limitation um, to the speed with which this can be moved forward. So in relation to the packaging limitation uh, for AAV gene therapy, there's a couple of um, options for getting around that. So one option would be to provide multiple vectors, such as two vectors with different carrying capacities for which the uh, protein products um, or, or the mRNA, for instance, could reassemble uh, within the cell. And so this is um, a really intriguing idea that's um, in kind of early development. It does have a lot of potential, but it also requires a couple of events to occur that independently um, are not enormously likely to occur, and so that in combination they're even less likely to occur. And you know, and so that given that you need very, very large doses of gene therapy, for instance, to be effective uh, for many of these monogenetic diseases, uh, with a single vector and a single gene that's, that's relatively small. Um, this dual vector approach, I think, is, is promising, but it will likely need to wait until um, greater efficacy is observed with the single vector approaches um, so that doses can be lowered and the likelihood that all of the DNA will get to where it needs to be at the same time um, is, is a little bit more likely. 
Um, there's also the generation of uh, shortened versions of the regulatory elements, so the things that aren't um, the, uh, the target gene, so that'll give a little bit more carrier capacity, but that, that also has a limit to the amount of real estate you can generate. There are programs such as the microdystrophin gene therapy programs for Duchenne muscular dystrophy that leverage an enormous amount of scientific study um, to have identified key structural and functional elements of very large genes that can lead to much smaller constructs that ideally have the same um, efficacy or the same function as the full length thing. And so in the microdystrophin strategies is three, at least three uh, agents in clinical trials right now that are different, smaller dystrophin sequences that fit into an AAV genome. Each of these three have are based on research saying that a different shuffling of dystrophin elements to the exclusion of the majority of the dystrophin sequence uh, should be able to recapitulate most of the functions um, of full length dystrophin. And so if you can get away with that and fit it into an AAV, that's, that's a great solution. Um, and the degree to which um, that occurs is, is still obviously under investigation, but it's a promising approach. And then uh, finally, if your gene's too big, um, but for instance, you have a working copy and a not working copy, which is the case with uh, what they call haploinsufficiency, um, it may be possible to use your limited carrying capacity of your AAV to target its regulation. And so in this case of, of haploinsufficiency, to drive up the expression of, um, of the wild type or, or healthy allele uh, so that you have more uh, total protein that has the appropriate sequence um, and thus rescue the disease phenotype. And so the idea here, of course, is just to uh, manipulate something outside of um, the relatively large gene that's within your carrying capacity and, uh, and modulate the larger gene's expression. Now, in terms of looking at the potency and selectivity of uh, AAV gene therapy um, uh, agents, there's a couple of approaches that are currently under investigation. There's some really promising work in capsid engineering at the early development side of things um, that is either meant to um, target much more specifically certain tissues uh, or to evade inflammatory responses. And so these are um, new strategies being performed by a number of groups right now. And these innovations aren't necessarily yet integrated into the current clinical trials. And so some of the issues related to safety um, or dosing uh, and, the, and the other challenges in the current clinical trials may be um, improved greatly with just the integration of these new approaches um, into, into using even the traditional transgenes uh, that, that are in testing right now. Um, there's also the possibility of manipulating your promoters to uh, more specifically target where the gene product is expressed, and then uh, also including things like enhancer elements to target how much. And so in, in all of these cases, it's more of an issue of getting, you know, um, a greater effect for uh, a given dose by making everything more potent and more selective to where you want it. Now, just to finish up, it's also important to identify that there are some logistical challenges to gene therapy that really limit the pace of progress um, and, and provide some of the challenges that people don't necessarily recognize. And so gene therapy products are comp complex macromolecules. They're, they involve protein and they involve capsid, uh, sorry, capsid proteins and DNA. And the, um, the entire production process is, is relatively inefficient. Um, and yet the effective treatment of patients um, and especially adult patients is gonna require absolutely enormous doses. They're, they're frankly difficult to comprehend on a normal scale. And so, and yet at the same time, you are required to produce a great amount of this uh, material 
and yet there's the potential for impurities to be seen in the manufacturing process that are going to limit um, your safety profile. And so you need some sort of consistent, clean, safe way of producing uh, a very, very large amount of these complex molecules. And this is really a barrier uh, to the translation of a lot of gene therapies. And there are there is a limited number of places that can do this uh, particularly well as ever growing. But this uh, certainly is a, an actively um, growing area of uh, manufacturing and research. And, and there's a lot of um, room for improvement still. And so when you think about the fact, uh, the things that you need to develop, you need to develop uh, some sort of system for the expression of your protein. Then there needs to be a system for harvesting and purifying your protein. And then there needs to be a system for proving to yourself that it is equivalent in quality and that you are um, uh, maintaining your level of efficacy while also maintaining your level of safety without Im impurities. And so, um, and, and these are all fairly large asks for a, a, a program that is uh, significantly complex and requiring large doses. Um, further limitations include just the fact that there's a number of groups working on this in parallel at once, and it's obviously a very competitive environment. And so the learnings aren't necessarily shared uniformly across all groups, and each learning requires a very significant uh, amount of investment on, uh, on the, you know, by each group or by each company. Um, and, you know, in general, this is an inefficient and costly um, endeavor. And so the, you know, the degree to which you're seeing um, people change horses midstream, for instance, is limited by the fact that uh, it's just very limited in terms of um, uh, what you can do in real time in producing these doses. And then an additional component of this really relates to rare diseases with a fast track designation for which a lot of these gene therapies are being developed. There's a timeline associated with trying to develop something and get it into the clinic. Many of the diseases are very rare and very severe. And so, you know, in identifying your patient population, having everything get ready um, to go and everything, there's, there's a limited timeline. And so you can't wait for multiple generations of improvements in manufacturing to occur. Before, uh, before a company needs to move forward with its production plan. Uh, and then once you get your product, there's the potential for um, ideally what you want, of course, is a full capsid with full vector DNA, uh, but there's also a variety of product related impurities, right? So you could have empty capsids, you could have uh, partial capsids, so they have the capsids, but they only have a, comp a small component um, of the DNA, or you could have a capsin containing some sort of contaminant. And obviously these are all things that are not providing additional therapeutic effect, but they can uh, provide some level of risk associated with um, the response of uh, the patient or the, the host to, uh, the trans gene, uh, to the gene therapy itself. And so the range in which you have full to empty uh, capsids is hugely variable, and even the methods for quantification of it aren't standards. So you can see that it can vary from 10 to 90 percent. And then obviously that really manipulates the amount of um, total dose that of capsid, for instance, that a patient may uh, experience when uh, being exposed to a certain number of full capsids um, as the therapeutic dose. And um, so, you know, the concerns, of course, in the um, in relation to these impurities is that they may produce reduced efficacy and increased immunogenicity. Uh, but there's also the potential that these are doing something beneficial that we don't quite understand. As we'll talk about in the next talk, um, the immune responses that humans encounter in response to gene therapy really aren't modeled well in other um, animals. And so there's a lot of questions that can't be resolved through scientific studies of animal models. And a lot of it's coming up in real time in the human clinical trials in terms of what we learn. Um, and so we'll need to continue looking at what these full to empty capsid 
ratios and these impurities do um, as on the manufacturing side people continue to try to uh, optimize their manufacturing quality and techniques. And so in summary, uh, gene therapy is a manipulation of genetic material. Uh, there's a lot of different um, in vivo and some in vitro approaches being investigated. Um, <clears throat> the AAVs, recombinant AAVs, are generally promise, showing promising safety and efficacy for the treatment of genetic diseases. And this is a topic I'll go into more in the next section, uh, in the next talk. Um, the idea, of course, is that our AAVs are designed to be uh, from a non-pathogenic naturally occurring virus that has the, um, the genes associated with self-replication uh, removed in favor of the, the target payload. Um, they don't necessarily cause uh, genotoxicity integration into the genome, and uh, they have a variety of serotypes to choose from. Uh, in terms of the delivery to target tissues. Um, obviously, there are limitations, as we just discussed, including packaging capacity, potency, and uh, manufacturing uh, issues. And these are all things that are under active investigation, um, but for which there's a lot of promise in on the research and development side of things. And so with that, I'm going to close. Um, thank you for your attention, and I hope this was instructive. The next talk will focus more on what we're seeing when we try to use these things.